All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third Ishihara Colloquium. This is being held online this year. And uh, my name is Alvaro Celestino with Tech and Cult Engineers in San Diego, and also the Vice President of the ERI San Diego chapter. Uh, thank you all for coming and attending today. Uh, thanks to our speakers, Ian, Jay, and Aaron. Uh, and I also want to thank our sponsors, uh, who are the Seismic Safety Commission, the California Geological Survey. Uh, our gold sponsors are RMA companies, Tech and Cult Engineers, and Tensar. And our silver sponsors are Maurer and Keller. I uh, also want to thank our co-moderators today, Jorge Meneses and Gilberto Mosqueda, uh, also part of the planning committee for this webinar series. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Gilberto. And uh, for those of you that joined us last Friday, uh, welcome back. Uh, last Friday, we had uh, three presentations on seismic isolation. And today, like you know, we'll talk about damping systems. Uh, the next Friday, uh, we'll be discussing soil structure interaction, and Jorge Meneses will be co uh, moderating that, that talk. Um, first, I'd like to welcome Jorge Meneses, uh, who is the president. Uh, of the ERI San Diego chapter. And Jorge will give us uh, some background on the Ishihara Colloquium series. Jorge. Okay, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the ERI San Diego chapter, welcome everybody. And thank you for attending uh, the second part of this third uh, Ishihara Colloquium series on earthquake engineering. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for your continued support to our activities, uh, our projects. So the Shihara Colloquium has become a tradition in our chapter. So we have, uh, we've been organizing this colloquium in the last few years, and uh, we had a very good reception, very good attendance, not only from around San Diego, but from all over California, the country, and also some international participants. So given the success of this is that we are continuing, we couldn't have it last year because of uh, the pandemic. And this year, uh, still we are having this uh, on virtual mode, uh, <clears throat> but continue moving ahead. Uh, we organizing this uh, colloquium series. Uh, we named the series after the name of Professor Kenji Shihara, who is an emeritus professor from the University of Tokyo and have uh, made a lot of contributions uh, internationally to the development of earthquake engineering, particularly geotechnical earthquake engineering. We, have, we had him uh, two, uh, two years ago attending personally uh, this uh, colloquium series um, uh, here in San Diego. Uh, traditionally, we have organized this colloquium series in, in the campus of UCSD or in the campus of San Diego State University, uh, two major universities uh, in San Diego. Uh, so as um, Alvaro already mentioned, last week we have the part number one, base isolation. Uh, part number two that was moderated by Professor Gilberto Mosqueda, UCSD. Today, we are going to have Alvaro Celestino moderating the part two, dumping systems. And then next week, we are going to have soil structure interaction that I will moderate. And we are going to have as uh, speakers, uh, Brett Lizundia, Rutherford and Chekin, Cici Nicolau with NIST, and Professor Jonathan Stewart at UCLA. So you are also invited and welcome to attend and participate in next Friday, next Friday, part three, soil structure interaction. And again, I would like to reiterate our thanks to our sponsors, the Seismic Safety Commission, California Geological Survey, RMA, Degenkolb, Tensar, 
Maurer uh, and Keller. Thank you to our sponsors to make it, uh, this event uh, possible. Um, I know that many of you are members of ERI, and probably some of you are not members of our regional chapter. So I, we would like to invite you and um, welcome to become members of our chapter. And also for those of you who are not members of ERI, become members of ERI. There are many benefits becoming a member. So in the next slide, you can see the <clears throat> link. So you can become a member of our chapter. Just to become a member of our, our, our chapter, we are just requesting, you know, a modest, a modest fee of $25. So also what you can do is very easy. Just Google EERI San Diego and you will go straight to our website. Finally, I would like to make an announcement, an invitation. Uh, we were asked to make this announcement. And this is an event that is hosted by Cal OES funded uh, by FEMA and organized by ATC. And this is about a webinar training, a seismic evaluation of older concrete buildings for collapse potential. Uh, this is targeted basically for structural engineers and we take, uh, will be on Wednesday, June 9th, from nine to one Pacific time. Uh, online, the instructor will be William uh, Holmes with Rutherford and Chekin, Abby Lill with the University of Colorado Boulder. They will be feel free, and you will have there you have there the link uh, to register. So we are going to record this uh, webinar, and also the link will be posted on our on, on our website. We have received several emails about uh, receiving these PDH credits, certificates. So we are going to, prov to provide more information, more details at the end of the webinar, uh, next webinar, next week, part three, solid structure interaction, okay? Thank you again for attending um, uh, to, this, uh, to this event. Thanks, Jorge. Um, and like I said, today we'll have three presentations by Ian, Jay, and Aaron. Um, as we already are used to do in this colloquium, we'll have the three presentations first, and then we'll have a, a, each is gonna last about 25 minutes. And then after the presentations, we will proceed with the questions and answers section, or it's also like a discussion section. Um, so really first, a quick reminder to write your questions during the presentations in the questions and answers section. At the bottom of your screen, you're going to see that there's a questions and answers section. So you can write your questions there. Um, and if you have any issues, uh, technical issues or comments, you can write those on the um, chat uh, field at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be monitoring the questions throughout the session. Uh, we'll try to respond to your questions during the presentations, but we also are going to uh, discuss the questions as many as we can during the questions and answers portion of the webinar. Uh, but before we start, uh, let me introduce uh, a sponsor today, uh, the California Geological Survey, CGS, and I'd like to introduce Daniel Swenson uh, with CGS. Daniel? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan Swenson. I'm a senior civil engineer with the California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program of the California Geological Survey. As you know, today's presentations will be about damping systems. Over the years, the Strong Motion Program has installed instrumentation on many structures with damping systems in order to measure the actual accelerations and displacements of these structures during seismic events. The recorded response data of these structures is publicly available and can be found at strongmotioncenter.org. We hope you'll visit the website and take advantage of these resources. CGS is pleased to be a sponsor of this webinar series and appreciates EERI San Diego for putting it on. And we look forward to the presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Let's get started. Um, our first speaker, is Ian Aiken with SIE. 
Ian is a principal with uh, seismic isolation engineering in Berkeley, California. He has more than 30 years of experience in earthquake, structural, and civil engineering, and he holds a bachelor degree of engineering from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, a master's and doctoral degrees uh, from Berkeley. His areas of expertise are seismic isolation, passive energy dissipation for seismic structural control, and the use of nonlinear analysis methods for structural analysis. He's worked on nearly 100 seismic isolation and energy dissipation projects, including many notable buildings, bridge, and industrial structures worldwide. And for more than 20 years, Ian has been extensively involved in the development, testing, and implementation of buckling restrained braces in the US, with notable firsts, including the first project in the US, the first hospital in California and the US, the first bridge in the US to use BRBs and recently the Wilshire Grand Tower in Los Angeles. Thanks, Ian, for joining us. Alvaro, thank you for the introduction. And uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, EERI San Diego chapter for their efforts uh, in organizing the colloquium and uh, for the invitation to participate today. Thanks to all. We're going to take a bit of a whirlwind tour through damping devices, um, types of devices, uh, and take a, a snapshot look at a few uh, projects. I'll say a few words about uh, the recent uh, evolution and changes in code provisions, and we'll also uh, finish up with a few comments about um, design and project implementation considerations. Before we start and get into the details, you know, damping was in the news this week, uh, or perhaps the lack of damping was in the news. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw the reports about a tall building in Shenzhen, uh, according to the media, wobbling. Um, I don't think that's a technical term we use in structural, but uh, I saw it in quite a few news articles. It wobbled to the extent that 15,000 people inside the building decided to get out. It took them about a, an hour and a half to do so. When I first heard about it, I thought maybe it was an earthquake, but that was pretty, pretty quickly and I think has been um, comprehensively dismissed. The other thought was wind, um, although it was very low at the time. And then uh, I wondered about a damping system and started Googling and lo and behold, um, someone had already postulated on uh, Twitter that perhaps the mass damper had been hacked. Um, I'll say that uh, actually, I don't think that the building has a damping system, so I don't think that's the explanation. But uh, when structures don't have enough damping, significant um, problems may eventuate. And this is under a mysterious cause of vibration. When it's related to earthquake, it's more fundamental. Uh, I'm not going to say in my subsequent um, coverage of devices and applications anything more uh, about uh, Japan. Suffice this slide here, um, which is to give you a sense of where things stand in Japan. The, um, in this case, slightly um, inappropriately named Japan Society for Seismic Isolation, uh, over the years, several decades of its existence has been very active in the field of uh, energy dissipation or damping systems. Uh, they have developed um, much documentation and the first notable document was a manual related to design and construction of what are generally referred to in Japan as passive control systems. That's the terminology we use for energy dissipation or seismic damping. Uh, this slide here, a lot of thumbnails, no need to look at details, but it gives you a sense of uh, how extensively they've considered many different types of devices and uh, different implementation configurations. Let's jump in and look at a few different types of devices that have seen use in the US and throughout North America. The earliest perhaps to be commercialized and promoted was one type or 
uh, yeah, one type of friction damping device, Paul Dynamics in uh, Montreal, started in the in the late 90, mid to late 1980s. The project on the left was their first notable project, uh, a large new building at Concordia University in Montreal that used uh, what we'd regard in the, in the West or in high seismic regions as relatively small devices in cross bracing configuration. A project uh, out here on the West Coast is the Moscone Center edition that was done in the early 2000s, used larger braces and uh, larger friction dampers, should I say, in diagonal braced configurations. And there are many others throughout uh, North America, Central and South America, including uh, the one example we see here, see here a tall building uh, about 600 feet in Mexico City that was completed three or four years ago and uses very large devices up to nearly 2000 kips friction slip force in diagonal braces. Another type of friction device is that that's been developed by a company called DampTech. Uh, unlike the uh, Paul and uh, or QuakeTech configurations that primarily utilize inline or linear sliding, this um, device mechanism harnesses um, rotational sliding friction. Uh, you can see an element in a test machine in the lower right there and was recently implemented in an interesting uh, retrofit application in San Francisco, where devices were placed between two structures to protect um, the more historic and, and uh, architecturally significant structure on the right. Uh, and DAMTEC also has, uh, or oh, I should say additionally has been used extensively worldwide in many different countries. Here are two significant examples in Japan, very large devices used in a tall building at the time it was constructed. It was the tallest building in Japan. And also uh, interestingly um, adaptable or let's say versatile is the ability of these devices to be used for large deformation applications. In this case, uh, as part of a, a damping uh, damping component in an isolation, seismic isolation system. The units you can see here are good for uh, approximately plus or minus two feet of movement range. Uh, there are other uh, more novel and more recent uh, frictional systems that have evolved. This one is particularly interesting, uh, developed in New Zealand over the last decade. Uh, it's a a frictional system that has recentering or restoring force characteristics. Uh, you can see the flag type hysteresis that's achieved in the lower right there. And it functions um, with uh, counter opposing wedge shaped elements that cause the device to want to move back to center uh, when it's subject to um, collinear movement, extension movement or compression movement along its primary axis. All of the frictional systems um, have common components, uh, at least in the sense that there needs to be an essential uh, uh, feature to provide, uh, let's say normal force, compression force on the sliding interface. Um, in most applications with high control and reliability, additionally, some sort of spring mechanism in, is used in line with the tension mechanism, typically bolts, to ensure reliability and control over the application of the friction force. These uh, recentering devices are quite versatile, um, able to be used in quite a number of different configurations. And here are a couple of examples. Uh, we can see a medical office building on the left uh, where devices were used both in inline braces, so braces with restoring force, uh, and also in rocking walls. Uh, we can see walls in the medical office building. The project on the right is closer to home, a uh, new offices for a structural engineering company in Vancouver up the coast. And here we can see applications where in both cases where they're combining the the low damage design objectives with the devices and the ability to provide restoring force and recentering with the uh, utilization of sustainable materials. 
So the next main category of devices are metallic devices, uh, of which there are many. Uh, I'm just going to show you a few and some uh, that will be uh, relatable to projects that um, some or many of you will be aware of. The first is what's called the lead extrusion damper. Uh, has a long history. Back to the 1970s, it was developed uh, in New Zealand by the same uh, researcher who also developed the lead rubber bearing that's um, widely used in isolation. This specific example that we see here uh, is a recent project, award-winning project in San Francisco. By, uh, the designers were Ma, David Ma at Ma Structural Design, where they utilize the lead extrusion dampers as part of a dissipative mechanism for rocking walls. Uh, there are, as I said, many different types, different ways to yield steel. This is uh, an interesting one that has been developed by Cast Connects amongst their ar array of cast products. Um, this is essentially using a characteristic um, or a configuration that has been around from the beginnings of um, yielding steel devices for seismic, and that is using the triangular plate um, loaded out of plane where you develop the configuration of the plate and the loading is such that you can develop a distributed plastic yielding over a, an extended surface or portion of the steel. In this case, they've configured an array of these uh, triangular plates into a what is a pretty interesting looking device. It's been used in a few projects, one of them again up the coast in British Columbia an art museum near Vancouver. Well, we're all familiar with BRBs that have, uh, I would say, become almost ubiquitous in the seismic braced framing arena over the last two decades. Um, but they've also been used in some special, larger, unusual applications where they're, rather than just following the codified approach for design, they've been designed explicitly uh, as damping devices or as uh, hysteretic structural fuse elements, in this case in the Wilshire Grand Tower, where they are configured throughout the height at three outrigger levels. Essentially, their, their benefit is to provide a fuse mechanism and uh, protection to the outrigger columns under MCE level loading. That application uh, involved extensive work regarding the braces, uh, utilized large full-scale essentially brace testing and a detailed three-dimensional non-linear finite element analysis of the brace elements themselves uh, and also their integration into the structure. Um, so now to touch on the last family of devices, what we've looked at or what I've um, discussed thus far are all devices that we really regard as um, a rate independent or displacement dependent devices. They are the frictional and the, uh, visco uh, the steel yielding systems really don't exhibit behavior that varies with the rate of loading. This class of device, the, the rate dependent devices or the viscous and the viscoelastic devices are inherently rate dependent, which is a distinguishing characteristic from these and everything we've seen thus far. Viscous dampers, many of you will be aware of, they have seen the most extensive use in the US and in many other places around the world for both new and retrofit uh, seismic construction. Um, there are many variations on the general class of device. The typical cross section that you see here is um, of a a general configuration of a Taylor type fluid viscous device. In general though, they all these, this family of devices have the ability to be designed with a variable or, or varied force output as a function of velocity. Um, that can be achieved, uh, achieved through uh, orificing and, and appropriate design of the piston or in other manufacturers, the use of valving and so on to change pressure and oil flow. Uh, in the Taylor type devices, even in the uh, fixed, the orifice and the piston head configuration, 
they are able to significantly control the behavior of the devices. You can see here a range of force velocity output um, behavior that's achievable. The force is a function of velocity um, with a, a, let's say, a simple coefficient, damping coefficient, and the velocity of loading, the rate of loading um, uh, as an exponential function. So the line that you can see here is um, the exponential on velocity is the power of 0.3, which is a, a widely used or approximately in that range, a widely used um, characteristic for seismic dampers. It has a couple of nice features. You can see in the force displacement hysteresis loop below, you generate significant energy dissipation tending toward rectangular behavior. Um, but also if you look at the red line in the upper plot, uh, the force velocity behavior exhibits a, a, a capping or a fuse type behavior that is um, not dissimilar from what we, ex what we can achieve out of yielding steel components in the force displacement regime. So this uh, velocity characteristic is particularly attractive for seismic design. It's been used in many of the applications. Here are two, a large retrofit in Oakland uh, that utilize dampers in single diagonal configurations. And then below uh, a large uh, tall new building in Portland utilize dampers in uh, diagonal chevron braces with the dampers mounted at either the bottom or the top of the uh, chevron configuration. There are other much more exotic configurations. Um, just a mention of one, uh, this tall building in San Francisco that was completed uh, just a few years ago, 181 Fremont utilizes um, a sophisticated configuration of viscous dampers and BRBs in the very long mega braces um, where the BRBs and the dampers are both uh, in parallel and separately in series. Uh, to touch upon, uh, just touch upon viscous wall dampers, which we will hear about this project uh, in detail from Jay following uh, in the next presentation. Uh, these devices um, provide behavior that um, slightly different to the fluid viscous dampers that we've just seen. They have a component of uh, elastic characteristic to them as well. So they're providing both uh, damping and an elastic stiffness characteristic. Um, and this project, uh, the project that Jay will describe in detail was both the first application in the US and it was a hospital through Oshpod. Um, and a touch upon or a visit to the last class of viscous and viscoelastic devices, the um, what we generally refer to as viscoelastic dampers. Um, these are um, principally a, a, a material that's called an acrylic copolymer that was de originally developed and has been evolved by the 3M company over decades. The first example and, and the incredibly notable example was the application in the original World Trade Center towers, WTC one and two where these dampers were included to enhance the building response under wind. Um, there were uh, 100 dampers per story, so no less than 10,000 dampers in each tower. Um, this concept was evolved in the mid 1960s. The construction was complete in the early 1970s. Um, about a decade and a half later at Berkeley, we started investigating extending the viscoelastic material for seismic applications. The notable requirement, uh, the notable extension was that the viscoelastic material, which um, inherently is being loaded in shear, the yellow layers that you can see in the device schematic here are deformed in shear. Uh, under wind loading, these layers are being deformed only one or 2%. Under seismic, they're being deformed 100 times more than that, up to 100 to 200%. So it was a significant extension of the material. 
uh, went on to see a number of building applications uh, in the US through the 1990s and the mid 2000s, their, their applications for seismic have generally tapered off in the US, but have continued to see significant use in Japan and elsewhere. Um, more recently, uh, one type of damper that has been developed uh, that utilizes the uh, 3M viscoelastic materials called the viscoelastic coupling damper or VCD, uh, which is, uh, let's say, a modern incarnation uh, using uh, uh, what is now the fourth generation of the 3M viscoelastic material that now um, doesn't look very similar to what the old World Trade Center dampers look like at all. It's now able to configure very large um, shear areas or effectively mobilize large shear areas of the viscoelastic material by utilizing um, a multiple stacked or forked configuration. And now large capacity dampers, large capacity in terms of stiffness damping and uh, overall force are possible. Um, and some very interesting configurations or, or really the essentially um, novel and interesting aspect of the VCD configuration is its application uh, in this, uh, what we call a, a, the coupled wall configuration uh, as a replacement for a traditional shear link where the, the viscoelastic material is being mobilized by the, the mechanism that you can see here, mobilized by the uh, relative movement that occurs by rocking between the walls. Um, and the, the other very interesting uh, or extension or evolutionary aspect of the VCD development has been the integration with a hysteretic mechanism, and that is um, integrating uh, a link yielding mechanism, which allows for staged behavior, utilizing the viscoelastic behavior under low uh, under all levels of wind loading and low to moderate seismic and then fully mobilizing the shear links under high seismic deformations. So in the tall buildings, these devices have been utilized in coupling beams or in outrigger configurations. And without a lot of mention about the details of modeling, but really just to touch upon a few points that, uh, a few main points, um, that are worth understanding. And that is that the, what is regarded 20 to 25 years ago as, a, as inherently complex or almost um, unreasonably difficult um, behavioral characteristics to model for the purposes of structural analysis are really much more uh, attainable these days with the evolution and understanding of material properties, the extension and development of analytical models and particularly also computational power means that now the frequency and temperature characteristics are able to be incorporated directly into um, structural design analysis. You can see in the loops on the right hand side, um, a comparison between actual test behavior and perform 3D modeling for a 50 story building. Some very large scale testing has been undertaken, uh, full scale in this configuration, uh, elements up to 4,000 uh, kilonewtons have been loaded. Um, it's uh, approximately 1,000 kips have been loaded under uh, dynamic seismic uh, conditions. Of course, the dynamic loadings are essential and important because the device behavior is a function of the rate of loading and it's really not meaningful to be loading it quasi-statically. Uh, and also uh, you can see in the inset photograph there, a large uh, full-scale coupled wall sub-assembly test configuration that was uh, undertaken at uh, Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal a few years ago. Um, this slide and video, um, we can see the video start to play out here. Um, shows a stage sequence of loading. At the low level, we're seeing the behavior only of the viscoelastic under um, initially wind loading and then service level, level seismic. Um, and as the um, amplitude of displacement, this is actually a stacked video of two tests. Um, we'll see the motion die down and then the second test will begin. And this is a 
MCE level test, you can see how the device behavior changes. The viscoelastic uh, region reaches a, a limit or a control limit on behavior and the uh, shear link, the shear links at the ends of the element are mobilized and extremely large deformations in this case of the order of um, four to five inches are achieved between the ends of the device under MCE and MCE plus level loading. These tests were done in support of a project that we'll see in the subsequent lot slide. Um, the tests were done uh, in the middle of last year for a project that's now under construction. And um, that project uh, is the middle one in the slides. It's uh, uh, two tall towers in Manila in the Philippines. Um, and a couple of other examples, a tall building uh, in Toronto was the first project in North America to utilize this type of device. Uh, and also another upcoming multi tower project in the Philippines. Few words about code provisions to finish up. Um, the damping code provisions have generally, um, and I say generally um, um, in a loose sense, have followed the development and the evolution of the isolation provisions, but with, let's say, a rather more nonlinear progression. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but suffice to say, through this uh, evolutionary stepping stone through the FEMA provisions and through uh, the FEMA NEHERP recommended provisions, and then through FEMA 273 and 356, we now reached a point where in the last two cycles of ASCE 7 and 41, um, we're at a point of relative stability and maturity. Uh, in ASCE 716, there were major changes as there were, uh, we heard from Reed last week about the isolation provisions. They allowed now um, mostly the use of code-based spectra and not exclusively the need for site-specific hazard. Um, not a complete um, alignment with chapter 16, um, there's still the separation between seven and 11 sets and slightly different scaling requirements. The, one of the big notable um, uh, advancements was the introduction of uh, the explicit requirement for treatment of property modification factors to account for device behavior variability. And the other significant aspect was a shifted or a, an emphasized focus on nonlinear response history analysis uh, and a de-emphasizing of response spectrum or um, uh, ELF methods. Um, lastly, the peer review requirements were slightly eased and there was a, a introduction of um, alternative rational approaches for production testing. After the big effort in uh, uh, 2016, well, let's say there wasn't a huge amount of, of ongoing effort or, or energy or enthusiasm for another major round of changes, nor was there a need. Um, and the upcoming changes that we're going to see in uh, the 22 cycle are going to be relatively more minor. Uh, as with isolation, um, we're now bringing the damping provisions more more completely into line with the larger document standard with regard to seismic ground motion criteria. Um, now there are, remain only a few minor clarifications on chapter 16. Um, a very small adjustment to uh, procedure selection and easing of the requirements, again, bringing the isolation and the damping provisions into alignment on the allowance for response, spectral al as response spectrum analysis. And then lastly, perhaps the most notable um, feature in the 722 upgrade is the um, introduction or, or an expanded elaboration on lambda factors, what they're for and what you need to do in terms of quantifying them by test and specifically including now um, some requirements for qualification testing. So a couple of 
comments about project considerations, and I know I'm running the clock, so I'll keep these brief. Um, there's, with the, the primary focus on nonlinear response history analysis, um, compared to a typical building project, there's more required. Don't underestimate the time and the effort required to do it right. Um, uh, there's always, you, you're gonna take more detail, detours, there are a couple of pitfalls and traps along the way that inevitably you're gonna fall into. So make sure you allow the time and recognize the effort to do it right. Um, you need to recognize the importance of bounding parameters. These relate, these are the essentially the lambda factors, property modification factors that importantly relies upon manufacturer knowledge. And you need to make sure you're working with a manufacturer who knows and understands the device that you intend to use and make sure you know how to use the software that you intend to use. Um, peer review, it's required. Uh, it takes additional time. Um, the, the most succinct advice is start early, be collaborative, and make sure you involve all parties along the way. A couple of mentions on testing. Uh, it's also required. Um, I touched upon rate effects and talking about devices. So be sure that wherever you need to test at the end of the day is capable of doing the tests that you need to be able to do. Um, the, these images here relate to Jay's, projects that were, Jay's project that we're gonna hear about in a few minutes that involved very, let's say, sophisticated state-of-the-art of testing that was conducted at UC San Diego. So my last slide brings us back to the building in Shenzhen that we heard about or was in the media earlier in the week. Uh, I can't resist one more mention because here we have in one article the intersection between cryptocurrency and damping systems. Um, I didn't expect to ever see them in the same news story, but there you are. Um, now they're maybe alluding to what may be the cause of the problem. There are subway lines underneath the building. Uh, temperature had fluctuated. All of those though seem a little unlikely given that the building's 20 years old. It seems like an unusual convergence of factors that have resulted in the behavior that occurred. Um, but the last sentence there, actually the last, um, second to last sentence of the news article is sage and perhaps straightforward where perhaps the building needs a damping system. So that's it, thank you very much. Um, I will um, uh, end my presentation and hand it back to Alvaro and we'll um, take questions through the Q&A and the discussion at the end, thank you all. Thank you, Ian, very interesting presentation. And yes, it, for anyone that has questions, please use the questions and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to answer as we go, but we can also answer at the end of the presentations. Our next speaker is Jay Love. Um, he's going to talk to us about um, retrofit design strategies with the Pisco's dampers. Jay Love has more than 40 years of experience, including master's planning, structural design, seismic evaluation, and retrofit design. He has considerable expertise in designing specialized buildings, particularly large and complex healthcare facilities. Jay's notable projects include the new design of the new Sutter Health California Pacific Medical Center, um, Hospital at Van Ness and Geary and the Kaiser Permanente LA Replacement Hospital. Jay has overseen and served as project mentor on numerous healthcare projects for Stanford Healthcare, Valley Care Medical Center, Stanford Hospital, Common Spirit, Kaiser Foundation, and Sutter Health. Thank you, Jay, for joining us. Thank you very much. I assume you can hear me. Control to select multiple. I'm going yeah, to share. I can hear you. And are, am I sharing now? Yes. Uh, can you um, click the presentation button? Yes. I now have just done so. It. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about this project. Uh, Ian has already introduced various uh, issues about the project. I'll take you through a little bit more detail of it. 
This is a case study in new design. Uh, as Ian mentioned, this was the first um, damping project uh, using Japanese technology, but bringing it here to California. It's a hospital in San Francisco, uh, located on a site in um, on Van Ness Avenue, a very busy, uh, actually several very busy streets. And this is the building as it was envisioned by the architect. Uh, you can see it's uh, got a, a tower sitting on a podium, uh, sloping site, a lot of complicated issues about that site. If we strip away the um, pretty exterior, you can see a, now a steel frame structure, a, basically a steel moment resisting frame and those little wall panels that you can see on the uh, left uh, facade and the tower in behind are um, the viscous wall dampers. Uh, some details about the site. It's about 11 kilometers east of the San Andreas Fault. The fault runs offshore of San Francisco. Uh, it's a 12 story building with two full basements, a little under a million square feet uh, and an essential occupancy structure. And the lateral force resisting system consisted of the steel moment resisting frame superstructure um, from the third floor up and supplemental viscous dampers. Uh, the project was done by Sutter Health, uh, CPMC, uh, general contractors, Herrero Bolt, um, with Herrick Structural or Herrick Corporation for Steel and Dynamic Isolation Systems, uh, who had a partnership uh, with a Japanese firm to um, manufacture the viscous wall dampers. And Smith Group were the architects uh, with Denkolb engineers working for Smith Group. One thing that was very important to this project, I think, was the integrated project delivery system. Uh, it has nothing to do with viscous damping, but it certainly made this project a whole lot easier from a risk standpoint. Um, the uncertainties of going into this uh, were not entirely covered, but were part of the uh, risk that the entire team took, something innovative uh, and something new, which the owner was very uh, interested in doing. So um, this is a performance-based design approach. Uh, Ian mentioned the evolution of the code. Um, this project got started quite a few years ago. And in fact, we were under ASCE 705. The chapter uh, for damping in ASCE 705 is fairly short, uh, not an awful lot of information in there. Um, we did establish that we needed to be able to meet life safety for the maximum considered earthquake. And for the design earthquake, we of course wanted immediate occupancy as you would want for any hospital. We wanted to be able to provide medical service immediately following the earthquake. So our basic design strategy was to uh, design a steel moment resisting frame to provide the necessary strength. And um, the code at that time, and still actually the same uh, requirement, uh, caps the reduction in strength to 75% of the base shear of a conventional building. So for a conventional moment, steel moment frame, uh, we're allowed to go up to a 25% reduction in seismic forces as measured by base shear. Um, however, when you uh, reduce the size of the structural steel members, of course, your, your deflections are growing. And that's where supplemental viscous damping comes in basically to control those deflections and to absorb energy. Because we were doing uh, time uh, response analysis, uh, we were allowed to increase our maximum drift ratios by 25% um, over the normal 1% uh, allowable uh, in the code. That uh, allowable increase in drift, I think is still part of the latest uh, uh, chapter uh, 18 in ASCE 7, although it's not at straight 1.25 anymore. So we were under the California Building Code with OSHPOT amendments for hospitals. Uh, as I mentioned, ASCE 705 didn't have an awful lot of regulations uh, or detailed design, so we needed to create our own design criteria. And we needed to negotiate that, of course, with OSHPOD. Um, and we also negotiated that with our, our peer review team, a team of three members, uh, one who was uh, I'll call it, say, an expert in uh, moment-resisting frame behavior, another who was an expert in nonlinear analysis and passive damping, and a geotechnical uh, expert. So we designed uh, the A7, uh, ASC705, and we used uh, ASC4106, Rehabilitation of Structures, um, because that's the primary source for nonlinear behavior of the structural steel members. 
a little bit about these viscous wall dampers. Uh, they were first developed in Japan um, in the late 1980s. I think the first uh, reports came out. Uh, it was the technology was licensed uh, to dynamic isolation systems. It involves a, essentially a box. Um, a, it looks like a wall, but it's a box, uh, a steel box with uh, this material, isobutylene, uh, between steel veins of, in the steel box. So the box is connected hard to the girder below, and the veins that come down from the girder above are have the uh, freedom to move within that box. Uh, as Ian mentioned, there is a velocity uh, and displacement and temperature dependent effects in this material. And of course, it's nonlinear. On the right, you see two very tall towers uh, that have been done in Japan. Uh, I think over 200 buildings in Japan have been done with these viscous wool dampers. A uh, little diagram here basically showing the, the, the simplicity of it, a steel box uh, connected below and a vein that re comes down from above and the vein can move back and forth, uh, creating the velocity uh, that creates the damping in the, in the uh, polyisobutylene. Oh, got a few things here, some equations that you saw from Ian's presentation. Uh, in this particular one, we used a, an alpha of 0.7. Uh, this was based on, the, based on the information that we'd received from Japan. And of course, the damping coefficients, we actually uh, calculated our own damping coefficients based on our prototype testing. Taking a look at uh, one of these in real life, this is our seven by 12 damper. Um, Armanath Kasalanati, who worked at DIS at that time, uh, standing next to it on the right. Uh, this is about to be shipped to San Diego for prototype testing. Um, the box has uh, horizontal channel stiffeners to keep the uh, plate, it's a fairly thin plate, uh, from doing too much buckling. And there are through bolts through the box, again, to keep the horizontal plates from uh, bulging out. Uh, as a vein goes through this material, it's creating a fair amount of internal pressure and it's, that pressure is being resisted by the flat plates of the outside box. Some of the uh, drawings uh, for this material, you can see it's actually, it's a very thin box. It's about the size of a, of a partition wall. It's connected through with bolts at the bottom connection, and it's connected through bolts, the vein at the top to the at the top connection. Um, one of the beauties of this particular system was um, the ability to locate this in the middle of the bay, leaving the uh, windows open. Uh, the architect and owner were certainly very pleased to not have to put diagonals through and in, from uh, one corner to the other corner that would cut across the windows. And of course, every bedroom in a hospital needs to have a window. So two bedrooms to a bay, we were able to um, size this, uh, our dampers, in order to allow these uh, windows to take place. Uh, in fact, I asked them, you know, what size are your windows? They said, or what's the distance between windows? They said eight feet. I said, great, I'll do a seven foot damper. And so we designed that specifically for this particular span and uh, window configuration. Generally, aspect ratio should be less than two on these, uh, 1.5 preferred. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in some of the Japanese uh, dampers are they use a nearly one-to-one -one, uh, ratios in, in their dampers. Looking at a elevation of, of our uh, Perform 3D model, uh, the squiggly lines going through the bays show the base where we had put in viscous wall dampers. There's really not a need to stack these uh, from one bay to another, um, as we would through a with a concrete shear wall, uh, we can space them around um, and we can move them from one bay to another. Uh, as you do move them to bays, and if they're not stacked, you you end up with some interesting collector issues to take the load in and out. Um, stacking them is probably the easier way to avoid some of that issue. Um, we did model nonlinear behavior in the beams, panel zones, and columns. Uh, for the building so that we could track the behavior of not only the uh, panels, but of course the steel frame. Uh, this building sits on uh, concrete basement walls, everything below the third floor down to um, four or five floors below were concrete basement walls. When we got started with this, we had data from Japan uh, in order to do our preliminary analyses. 
in order to get to a point where we could develop a prototype testing program. Uh, you can see on the uh, left a very simple uh, single bay with the damper located in the middle of that bay, a 2D damper. It's just a simple spring and dash pot approach. And with that, uh, with the correlation, we could very easily match uh, the hysteresis loop you see on the right to um, the uh, hysteresis loop from our analysis back to the uh, testing. Uh, in Japan, I think their general practice is to push them to smaller displacements than what we were pushing to. Uh, you'll see some differences here as I move from this relatively small displacement that's two inches uh, there to larger displacements. When we actually go to model this within our own structure, uh, this is the model that we created um, with rigid offsets to model the viscous uh, box itself with a uh, node in the uh, at mid height of the box where we have our dash pot and spring, and then our nonlinear behavior or hinges in the girders and columns and panel zones. So um, prototype testing, uh, ASC 7 chapter 18 talks about testing. If there's a minimum of two full size prototypes required. Um, and there's a 2000 cycle wind testing load uh, that wind testing load was developed long ago, um, several decades ago, I believe, uh, when the primary types of dampers were those cylindrical uh, fluid dampers uh, with very tight engineering tolerances and small orifices and things. Um, and the concern of that, at that time was over uh, many thousands of cycles would a leak develop. Uh, this box is a very simple box welded completely up. Um, we still needed to do the test because it was part of the code. However, it wasn't really uh, the, the idea that these boxes were going to spring links was a little out of um, uh, over expectation. So in addition to the 2000 testing, um, wind test, cycle wind testing, uh, we did needed to do some sinusoidal cycles, uh, five fully reverse cycles uh, out to the MCE displacement at a certain frequency. I think you've seen a different version of this picture in Ian's. This is the test lab in San Diego uh, uh, with the um, six degree of freedom table at the bottom and then the reaction blocks at the top. So we tested by the time we finished um, our full size dampers. We did our pre prototype, a six by 11, um, in order to get better analysis models. From those better analysis models, we came up with uh, prototypes for seven by nine and seven by 12 dampers. We have different floor heights in the building, so we needed different heights of dampers. Uh, we ended up with actually doing five of those. We returned one more time uh, because of some of the results um, of that 2000 cycle test uh, that left us scratching our heads for a while. So we did our in-plane cycle test. In addition, we did what we call time history tests. We took a response, uh, a displacement response from our time history analysis and used that as the input at the table to see how well we could compare the actual test results to our analysis. Uh, primary reason for this is to pick up on what are called first cycle effects. Uh, those effects that only occur on the first cycle and uh, were very, very difficult to model um, explicitly, so we needed a um, experimental uh, approach to identifying those first cycle effects. We also did look at out-of-plane displacements. Uh, there were, frankly, there was absolutely no effect on these four. If you were to move the top of the damper over a few inches and then run it through in-plane, um, there was no effect at all. So we ran um, some tests with, with uh, uh, changing velocity to see um, what happens? This is a test with uh, only a half an inch of displacement. On the left hand side, you see our forced time uh, input uh, with the increasing velocity, which in results in increasing, um, excuse me, increasing frequency, uh, leading to increasing velocity. And you can see the test on the right hand side. You see that elastic portion of it. Um, very little, well, there is obviously hysteretic behavior, um, but it's pretty constant or uh, reliable uh, oval there. If we push it out, start to push it out to two inches, um, we start to see the beginnings of these first cycle effects. If you look in the upper right-hand uh, quadrant or the lower left-hand quadrant, 
um, the first cycle is larger than the subsequent cycles. But again, it's a fairly consistent oval shape. Now let's push it out to four inches. And this is where you really see that first cycle effect. Uh, in the upper right quadrant, that very first cycle, the load there at around almost 700 kips um, is quite a bit different than the uh, subsequent cycles where the load was around 400 kips. So that's that first cycle effect going on. Now you can see that the um, hysteresis loop has flattened out. We're now getting more of a, uh, I guess, a rhombus shape here. Um, so there is both displacement dependence and velocity dependence on the left. Uh, we change the displacements. You don't start to see that first cycle effect until you get out to larger displacements. And you don't see that first cycle effect until you get out to larger velocities. Uh, this is our earthquake test. This was the input from our analysis for one particular um, damper. We took uh, one of our larger uh, records, one that had a, a pulse in it, uh, and selected that. Well, actually, we selected two records with pulses to come up with two different earthquake tests. Okay, it's not advancing. That's... Okay, it just advanced. Let's go back one, let's go back forward. Oop. Okay, there it is. So on the left-hand side here, oops, I've gone too. On the left-hand side, in green is our analysis, uh, the input, and in red is the test. Uh, if you take a look at the upper right-hand corner, the difference between the, re the red line and the green line is that increase in the first cycle on the first cycle effect. On the right-hand side, you could see the uh, force time history. And again, we could measure the increased forces on that first cycle. So uh, that feeds into something that Ian started talking about were property modification factors. We had very little guidance in those days because it wasn't really included in the damper uh, chapter. So we look back at how uh, modification factors were done primarily for base isolation. Um, the first line there is by far the dominant line, the first cycle effect. Uh, to go to upper bound from the nominal, uh, it's a factor about 1.6 to 1.8. Um, and we took a lower bound 1.0. Uh, the material in this polyisobutylene actually has a very low temperature effect. Um, and we have a building with um, air handlers in it that's going to keep the temperature between uh, you know, 68 degrees and 72 degrees. So our um, Factors for temperature were quite small. Uh, we had some uh, history on this material indicating that it doesn't really change over time. So we had a 5% up or down aging factor. And then we used specification tolerances for the average of all the dampers and for the individual dampers. So in all, we had an upper bound factor of about 1.9 to 2.2. That upper bound factor is important when trying to determine the strength demands on the frame from the dampers. Uh, the larger those factors are, the larger the strength that we need to design that frame for. The lower bound factor is important in calculating the maximum displacements. We had a reduction of about 26% there, and that's where we checked our displacements. So we're running upper bound analysis for strength and lower bound analysis for displacements. Um, Something we did not incorporate, but uh, figured out kind of late in the game was a way to incorporate that first cycle by just creating a slightly more complicated model for the viscous damper uh, using an extra tension steel only element. Um, and we compared that against our results. We did not end up using that within the model itself. We were too far down the road with Oshpod to throw something new in to our analysis. Uh, I believe you saw a little picture of this. This is the finite element analysis that was performed by SIE um, on behalf of the fabricator uh, DIS. Um, this model uh, was particularly helpful in doing the design um, or determining what the bolt loads were um, and designing the connection to the structure. And of course, determining whether there were any hot spots in the steel um, box that we needed to be aware of. There were some stiffeners that caused a few hot spots in a certain areas um, based on the finite element analysis. So um, base shear results uh, for the design earthquake on the left, 
In our upper bound damper system, uh, we had base shears of 13 to 14%, and then the lower bound base shears of 12 to 13%. And at the maximum um, percent for the upper bound damper and 16 to 18% for the lower bound dampers. Uh, looking at drift ratios, uh, we, oh, going back to the uh, ground motions, um, we had a negotiation with Oshpod. There weren't uh, about how many ground motions we were going to run. The code at one at time said, well, you can use three ground motions and the maximum of the results or seven ground motions. Um, at that time, and, and based historically on base isolation, the approach was to take the your ground motions and rotate them four different times. So if you had seven records, you would end up with 28 runs. It didn't make a lot of sense to us and to the seismologists that we were talking to at the time of just rotating records. Um, of much more importance was the variability between records. And so we proposed going to 10 records and not rotating them. Um, that later on became actually was worked into a later edition of the, of the CBC. So here you're looking at our uh, drift ratios up the building. Uh, the red line, the heavier red line is the average uh, to be compared against the black um, dashed line. Uh, we were essentially at about 1% drift uh, for all, um, for both directions with an allow of 1.25. On the right hand side, you could see one record. I think that's the se record seven that kind of took the building off in, uh, in a big direction there. But looking at the average, we were back within the allowable 1.25% uh, drift ratio. Story acceler accelerations. Um, the black dashed line there is the accelerations uh, coming out of the code for design of non-structural elements on a floor by floor basis. It's the uh, classic one that linear goes up linearly to a, a maximum, I think, of three times uh, FP, excuse me, three times acceleration. Uh, when you compare that against the actual accelerations, you see that the building uh, gets to about 60% uh, G and in the upper floors from nine to 16, and um, basically no longer continues to um, increase on a floor by floor basis. We use this to our advantage. Uh, the building had a its central plant up on the roof level uh, that included coolers or chillers, um, air handlers, emergency generators. And instead of designing for a very, very large number up there, we were able to design uh, for the accelerations from our, um, from our analyses. We included those accelerations on our documents, got them approved, and were able to use those. And importantly, here at the end, looking um, in the design earthquake, 97% of the energy is being absorbed by the dampers. So this is energy that is not being absorbed by our structural frame. When you go to a maximum considered earthquake, we were absorbing about 83% of the energy in those dampers, 7% of the energy into the beams, 5% uh, into the beams that did not, have, well, we had beams with dampers, beam without dampers. So if you add those together, 12% of the energy was being coming out of our beam hinges, 1% um, out of the columns, and 4% out of the panel zones. So our viscous damping was very effective in protecting our steel frame from um, having to absorb energy. A few pictures here to wrap up. Uh, this is the test rig in the DIS facility on the left to do our production testing, and some shock welding going on on the right hand side. Um, in the production testing, we negotiated a test procedure where we tested 100% of, I think, the first 20 dampers. There were 119 total. And if all of those passed, we dropped down to 50% of the next 20. And if all those passed, we dropped down to about 25% of everything after that. In total, we tested a little somewhere between 40 and 50% of the dampers uh, with none of them failing uh, to meet the um, requirements. Uh, here are the dampers uh, waiting to be shipped out of the site. And then, of course, the dampers are put onto a truck and shipped to the site. Uh, because the polyisobutylene is a very slow moving liquid, they have to be shipped vertically. And so there is a vertical limit as to how uh, tall these dampers can be um, to get under bridges. 
the first damper arriving on the site and being placed on, it on the first girder. And a wall of dampers, or two different walls of dampers uh, located in the building. If you'd like more information, um, there is an ASCE Structures article in March of 2016. Um, and with that, I'll wrap this up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Our next speaker is Aaron Malatesta. Aaron is a structural engineer uh, consultant in the field of energy dissipation devices and advanced seismic design. Uh, he graduated from Stanford University with a master's in structural engineering. And he has practiced structural engineering for consulting firms focused on both buildings and transport, transportation infrastructure. As a licensed professional engineer in the state of California, he has been involved in the design and retrofit of a number of different types of structures. He also has worked as a technical director for a viscous damper manufacturer, leading the development of technical publications, management of research and development activities, and working with engineers to improve the performance of structures using viscous dampers damping systems. Uh, he is actively involved also in ASC 7 and ASC 41 committees for seismic isolation systems and energy dissipation devices. Thanks, Aaron. All right, thank you very much, Alvaro. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, thanks also to Jay and Ian. Um, you really set up uh, the discussion well, and I'm excited to uh, present today. Um, thanks to all the participants for attending. Um, just a on a personal note, I would say that, you know, your support to ERI is, you know, incredibly important. I think if you look at over the last 30 years, um, the evolution of earthquake engineering has been phenomenal. And I think that we need uh, so, so associations like ERI to bring the industry together uh, and especially on advanced topics like damping. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, excited to be here today. Um, Today, we're generally gonna talk about three things. Um, the kind of applications, um, historical market and rising trends of, of viscous dampers, um, some basic viscous damper fundamentals, uh, and then also, and last but not least would be the, the retrofit design with viscous dampers. Um, I, um, there's, a, there's a great, uh, workshop that was done back in 1998 by Sionk um, for energy dissipation devices. And so I've uh, looked at some of the slides that were presented back in 1998 and they're, they're still applicable today. Uh, Charlie Kircher had one of his slides for, for applications of viscous dampers and it's similar to this with slightly modified graphics that I've, I've made on my own. But um, it's really important when looking at retrofit applications with viscous dampers to understand you know stiff versus flexible systems. In general, viscous dampers may be incorporated into retrofit designs of buildings with flexible lateral systems, but they're not as efficient for retrofit of stiff systems. So typically your steel moment frames, concrete moment frames are inherently flexible structures. Uh, generally, you know, under a BSC 2X or BSC 1X event, you're having drifts much, much greater than one, one and a half, even 2%. Um, and so steel brace frames, concrete shear walls, um, are very stiff devices that they don't have a lot of, uh, or not devices, structures, they don't have a lot of movement. And so viscous dampers really require relative movement to function and it's difficult to introduce the required levels of viscous dampings in stiff systems. Um, that can be seen um, if we look at the application of viscous dampers and in, in specifically in the US, um, I didn't um, open this up to the world. I think that if I start to talk about Japan, uh, the discussion can be a little bit more complicated, but, but specifically in the US, viscous dampers have been used to retrofit buildings for about 25 years. Um, I have a, a plot on the left and the vertical axis is the number of buildings and the horizontal axis is actually uh, the year. Uh, and so um, I've taken data that's from Taylor Devices projects lists, Enadyne's project list, and, and then very, very early on, 3M did some projects as well in the early 1990s, but not as, uh, not as, not so, so much anymore. Um, 
So what you see in, in the red are the number of steel frame buildings that were retrofitted with viscous dampers um, in that specific year. And then in the gray is uh, concrete frame buildings that were retrofitted. And then I also have a kind of a trend line there that's a three year average. Um, and so you can see, you know, over the last 25 years, pretty much primarily in the Western US, California, Oregon, and Washington, you know, 49 steel frame buildings, mostly pre Northridge moment frames. So if there's older buildings, anything that's pre Northridge isn't necessarily what we call, you know, the, the pre Northridge moment connection, but, but pre Northridge moment frames. Um, and then a lot of non ductile concrete buildings as well. So, so almost, I think 90, 90 buildings have been retrofitted with viscous dampers. That's a lot. You know, we look at the number of applications that um, have been done in a viscous wall dampers. It, it, it's, it's a lot less than that. And, and it, I think Ian did a great job of presenting a number of different solutions uh, from different types of devices. Uh, but really, uh, viscous dampers, and primarily tailored devices dampers, have been uh, utilized to retrofit all these buildings in the U.S. Um, I see a little bit of a drop off in, in 2008, 2009, all the way to 2013 and the number of buildings that are retrofitted. I'm going to, you know, I graduated from college in 2008. And so uh, I remember trying to get a job then. I'm going to go ahead and say that was the recession. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to explain uh, that, but, but you can see the rising trend now um, in terms of more and more um, of these types of buildings um, are, are being retrofitted. Um, and so what types of buildings make up those 90 different projects there that I'm not going to go into the same level of detail uh, that uh, Jay or Ian did, uh, but I simply want to give you a general feeling of where these dampers are being used uh, in what areas. Um, and so I've got the names of the structural engineers on the bottoms of each of these pictures and then the address in the city where it's located. Um, but we have a lot of steel frame high rise buildings. Um, I think uh, 350 California is 22, 101 Continental is 15, and Fox Plaza, I believe, is 29 stories. All tall, flexible steel moment frame buildings being retrofitted with dampers. Uh, we have a lot of steel frame mid rise buildings. Um, so, so they don't have to, maybe not just mid rise, maybe short, depends what you call it, but, but some, um, it's not just high rise, but, but shorter steel buildings that are pre Northridge moment frames are being retrofitted with basically stampers. Um, that, and then as well as hospital buildings. So Oshbod um, is very familiar with energy dissipation devices uh, and, and they can uh, absolutely um, understand the benefit of retrofitting uh, hospital structures, specifically, um, you know, you look at the SBC programs and, and um, looking at the mandatory required retrofits that are coming up, um, dampers can be utilized uh, quite well. Um, and then last but not least uh, would be concrete frame mid-rise buildings. Uh, so there's uh, buildings in Sacramento, Los Angeles, uh, Beverly Hills. Sometimes um, what also gets utilized is viscous dampers aren't always used at the height of the building, which we'll talk about later. They, they can be used to, to work with uh, soft stories. So it's not just that it's a non-ductile building or pre Northridge moment frame. They often get used in, in soft story type structures. And we'll go through that a little bit later. Um, if we look at uh, what's driving people to actually retrofit these, these buildings, um, primarily in the beginning, I would say in the early 90s is voluntary. Um, you know, uh, owners understood the risk uh that they had with an older building and they were looking to improve the performance um and then over the years um i would say i guess the government's been more involved or the media has been more involved as well you know we have institutional mandatory retrofit requirements by oshpa the california uc system and csu system the judicial system um public awareness um, i think is important uh, i think if you look at the new york times article that was released on the tall buildings in san francisco um, there was definitely a reaction to that um, if we look at legislative bills that were um, proposed but not passed it still created a public awareness uh, in california i think it was back in 2018 and then ultimately most recently you know neherp's uh, report to congress on recommendations for functional recovery it really raised awareness of the vulnerability of some of these older buildings um, and so if you look at last but not least would be the city mandatory retrofit ordinances this is this is really new and i think this is what's going to cause a rising trend in um retrofit with viscous dampers um, you know initially 
we're, you know, we're most concerned with unreinforced masonry buildings. Um, and that was the most, you know, vulnerable structure to, to an earthquake. Um, and then uh, the next types of uh, retrofits that require were wood frame soft stories. Now, generally dampers, you know, are not, they're definitely not applicable for unreinforced masonry structures for the most part. They could be used on wood frame soft stories. In some cases they have been, uh, it's just, it's not generally the most cost efficient uh, method for those types of applications. Uh, but but non dental concrete buildings and pre northern steel moment frames uh, buildings, these types of uh, mandatory retrofit ordinances for these types of buildings, um, they're just happening recently. And so I think that uh, more and more people are going to see dampers as a solution. Um, if we kind of do a quick bird's eye view just on the pre Northridge steel moment frames that were inspected in Southern California by the SAC joint venture as a part of the FEMA 351 publication. You can see that I think this is somewhere around uh, 600 buildings that were inspected as a part of that SAC joint venture from, and I took that data from the FEMA 351 document and I, you know, all each of those pinpoints represents an address that was inspected. Um, so far, there's been mandatory retrofit ordinances in those three uh, circular areas. And so that might encompass, I think around hundred buildings, um, but, but there's obviously uh, a number of other pre-Northridge moment frames just shown on this map here, um, not to mention downtown Los Angeles and south of Los Angeles and Long Beach, et cetera, where I live actually. Um, so I think that in general, the, the point is here that there's going to be business dampers and other damping devices are gonna be used more and more frequently to retrofit uh, these buildings. You know, I was born in 1985 and, and I kind of look back at 1994, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 36 years old now, and it, these buildings are getting older. You know, it's it, these buildings that were back in 1994. You know, they're getting older, and people are starting to notice that that it's time to get fix these buildings. We're going to transition now. We're going to move kind of away from um, the market and trends that are occurring, and, and talk about viscous damper fundamentals. Uh, both Ian and Jay talked about this um, specifically. I um, reference a damper cutaway from Taylor Devices here. Um, you know, we, we have a damper with uh, a clevis on each end. Uh, the clevis on the left side is attached to a piston rod uh, with a piston head. That piston head is in a chamber of fluid in blue there. Uh, and that fluid is surrounded by a steel cylinder with seals on each end. Um, this video also provided by Taylor Devices here. Um, and so if you want to understand uh, the behavior of the damper, um, as the building moves or one end of the damper moves, uh, the damper is stroked is what we would say and the fluid is actually forced to flow uh, most frequently through orifices of the piston head or around the surface of the piston head. And so what the manufacturers can do is customize the size of the orifices and also the surface of the piston head to provide a force velocity response that the engineer specifies. Um, so as the building sways back and forth, um, the kinetic energy that the building has is actually absorbed and converted into heat. Um, and so that's different than what Jay was actually showed a really great slide at the end of his presentation about the energy that's absorbed um, was primarily by the dampers. His was viscous wall damper, but here um, that energy that's being absorbed is, is actually converted into heat and eventually actually emitted uh, through the cylinder of the damper. I'm not gonna to talk too much about uh, force velocity behavior, but I will say that generally um, engineers are using a velocity exponent for seismic retrofit of buildings, um, somewhere between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. Um, so on the left-hand side on the bottom, there's a force velocity plot. And so what you can see is that both those force velocity curves have been tuned such that at that specific design velocity, which shown on the vertical axis as six inches per second, has the equivalent energy dissipation on the hysteretic plot on the right. Um, and so that equivalent energy dissipation shows that the damper force is a little bit higher when you have a velocity exponent that's higher, a 0 0.5 exponent, but in the lower velocities, you're getting less force on the structure. And so, if you kind of look at the hysteretic plot here, it's very minute, it's hard to see. And so there isn't that much of a difference. It is important, but there isn't that much of a difference 
but there is a, a difference in the out of phase characteristics and the forces that the structure will see when the dampers are excited during the earthquake. Um, so now we'll move on to the fun stuff. We'll look at retrofit design with viscous dampers. Um, I'll get into a little bit of theoretical at the very end and we'll move a little bit too quickly, but we're, we're not kind of in a workshop today. We really are just gonna um, focus on the general application of these devices. Um, so we first gotta talk about the, the response spectrum. You know, we look at ASCE 41, um, and so we have a definition of a response spectrum on the vertical axis, we have the spectral response acceleration. And on the horizontal axis, we have building period. Uh, what you might not notice um, is that there is a damping coefficient B. Um, and this is a function actually of the damping ratio, uh, ACE 41-17 equation 2-3, go you can check it out. Um, but so, when you look at a typical seismic response spectra, you're looking at a 5% damped response spectrum. And so when you have 5% damping, um, on the vertical axis is the effective viscous damping ratio. And then on the horizontal axis on this uh, plot is the damping coefficient B. Um, the, the B value is one. So, so if you go back to that response spectrum, it, it makes sense because you, you've seen all those equations before just without the B. Um, but as you add viscous damping, let's say for example, 25% viscous damping, you're actually going to have a B value of 1.7. So if you look at that seismic response spectrum and you have 25% damping, you actually get a significant reduction in seismic response. Um, that's really important and kind of generally encompasses on how we determine how much damping to include in, in structures. Um, and also that, that that no matter what the period of the building is, um, that, that you will provide that uh, the same reduction in response. Um, it's extremely important to understand damping effects on the building period. Um, viscous dampers, um, not viscoelastic dampers, but viscous dampers are velocity dependent. Um, they do not add stiffness to a structure. Um, however, uh, the building period is not just affected, you know, T is equal to the square root, two pi times the square root of M over K. The building period is actually also affected by damping. And so if you look back, you know, way back in dynamics to structures by Chopra, um, he has this, this graph here where he has the vertical axis as the damping ratio and the horizontal axis as the ratio of the damp natural frequency versus the undamped natural frequency. And so he, he says in that book, you know, hey, look, most structures have around 20% damping, which is his theoretic damping, damage to the structure. Um, and so when we, what he's really kind of getting at is that when you do response spectrum analysis, it's okay that you're using the natural frequencies, because if we look at this plot here, the, the frequency is not significantly altered when you have small amounts of damping. And so if you look at ASCE 41, it has this limit for linear procedures that says that the maximum damping ratio is 30%. And so that's really interesting. And the reason that they're doing that is they're saying, if you go over 30%, you're actually altering the characteristics of the building. And if you alter the characteristics of the building um, in terms of the uh, damping frequencies, your response spectrum analysis no longer works. Uh, and so that's why in, in general, it's actually whether or not response spectrum analysis works or not, keeping to that amount of damping is a good practice in terms of how you retrofit structures and not exceeding 30, maybe 35% of damping. Um, this is, the reason I wanted to talk about that is because generally when we look at viscous damping for non-ductal systems, um, we can consider a spectral acceleration versus spectral displacement plot. Here we have a non-ductal capacity curve that I'm showing. Um, and so there's a non-ductal failure, as you can see, very, um, very early on, right after yield. And so if you consider a demand spectrum for a structure that doesn't include dampers for this specific non-ductal capacity curve, um, you would see that the structure would actually fail, that you might even, you'd have damage or collapse um, without the dampers. And that, that's inherent in that all non-ductal or pre-Northridge uh, moment frame structures. Um, but by adding damping, you can get a global displacement response reduction like we discussed earlier. Um, and so what, by adding that, we can actually protect those non-ductal components within the structure. 
Um, so if we look at, you know, the design priorities, when we have a retrofit strategy, as I just discussed, we, we want to reduce the ductility demands on those critical component, components to prevent major damage or collapse. But another key priority as you're structural engineers and you're working with owners is you wanna limit the retrofit construction costs. And, and most likely you also wanna um, limit the interruption to business operations. Uh, and so if we consider the seismic response spectrum like we were just looking at uh, previously, and we consider a period, let's say somewhere around you know 1.2 seconds or something, um, then, if you have consider a conventional retrofit, but maybe adding strength or stiffness, um, when you add that strength or stiffness, you're actually altering the period of the structure. And by altering the period of the structure, um, you're actually increasing the base shear. Um, however, when you're adding viscous damping, um, you're actually able to reduce the response of the structure, but, but without altering the period, you're gonna have that, that damper base shear from the forces and the dampers being collected through the foundation is relatively small in comparison with the base shear um, that would be attracted by a stiffer system like walls or braces. From a performance-based design standpoint, both the retrofit schemes, whether or not you're putting braces or dampers in the structure are going to reduce the global displacement response and they're gonna protect the non-ductal components, whether or not that's you know, non-ductal detailing in a concrete moment frame or, or moment connections in a pre-Northridge moment frame. But the braces will sustain or walls will sustain significant damage because of deformation compatibility, whereas the dampers are not actually going to be damaged because the dampers are designed uh, to carry the load without damage. So viscous damping is a resilient form of energy dissipation. And so viscous damping will also reduce not just the story drifts and protect those non ductile components, but because it doesn't alter period and it reduces the seismic response, um, you're also going to reduce floor accelerations and protect non-structural components. Um, a couple uh, critical components and, and considerations I'd like to talk specifically with pre-Northridge steel moment frames. Um, this is a, you know, a picture that I stole referenced to FEMA 547 um, of a typical pre-Northridge wolf connection used in steel moment frames. Um, now, it's not just the moment connections that are found to be vulnerable uh, in pre-Northridge moment frames. Oftentimes panel zones, uh, it can be configuration issues like soft stories. It can be configuration issues like strong beam, weak columns, column splices, diaphragm deficiencies. Um, and it's important to know that, you know, dampers will most likely be able to protect moment connections, panel zones, configurations of soft stories uh, because these are deformation controlled components. Uh, but oftentimes, the, and those are in green on the, the plot here, but oftentimes, you know, components like column splices, uh, those are not going to be, you know, fixed by adding dampers to a structure. And they still need to be retrofitted. Um, and so dampers aren't magic. They don't solve every issue in some of these older buildings. And it's important to note that there still may be other areas of the structure that need to be retrofitted because of uh, their vulnerabilities. Um, so now that we've talked, um, you know, we've talked about the market, we've talked about general application of viscous damping and, and what's important. I'd like to talk, jump into damping system design and, and basic concepts. Um, the damping system primarily is a, is a supplemental system. There must be a primary seismic force resisting system. Uh, and so the DS or the damping system is not just the dampers, but it's all the structural elements that transfer forces from the dampers to the base of the structure, to the foundations, but also to the seismic force resisting system, including the, all of the horizontal framing system. And then last but not least, um, important to reference uh, ASCE 41-17 section 15.2.2.4, but viscous dampers and their connections are actually designed to carry demands beyond uh, the maximum considered loading. So BSE 2X loading. Um, and that doesn't just include the devices in terms of the design in terms of force, but it also includes stroke. Um, once we've, you know, determined, uh, well, when we're looking at a structure and we're looking at the layout for retrofit, um, one of the first things that we want to consider is the vertical layout. 
Um, typically, you want to provide business dampers on each floor level, uh, and you want to distribute dampers to minimize demands on the columns uh, and foundations. A stacked configuration like the far left here is obviously going to concentrate a significant axial load on those columns and the foundations, whereas other configurations like the staggered offset tower and checkered configurations distribute the dampers throughout the building and, and can help protect the the, those systems so they, you don't need to retrofit columns or foundations, which are going to minimize the cost of retrofit. Um, another uh, important aspect to consider is, is utilizing dampers within existing moment frames, whether or not that be concrete or steel, because of the existing strength that they have. Uh, it, those members are already strong enough and because the dampers are out of phase with um, displacements, you most likely are going to be able to ca carry the load without any retrofit on those existing uh, size before resisting system. Um, an important note, if we're talking about soft stories, um, damping um, is typically most beneficial within the soft floor level. Um, it's unique type of application. Um, and the building is, is going, by adding that damping, you're going to protect that building from that seismic hazard and you're going to be able to limit um, the deformation controlled action but it's important to note that the unfavorable collapse mechanism still exists um, and so soft weak stories are tricky uh, limited amounts of dampings can actually be provided in that floor level and if you make the dampers too stiff the structure will actually rigidize and forces actually will be transferred up to, to upper floors similar to adding braces um, with respect to the damping system design in terms of the plan layout, um, you wanna distribute dampers to minimize demands on the horizontal framing system. This can be really important if you have an existing deficiency in the diaphragm. Um, oops, go back. Um, you wanna place the dampers within plan so that you can protect that cords, collectors, et cetera. Um, so here, uh, the, what you'll see in these different plan views here is different ways that dampers can be configured. And it's really gonna depend on working with the owner, working with the architect, uh, but also you as a structural engineer, you know, obviously we want to come up with design efficiencies that protect the structure. In some cases, an inline shared application can be, is, is very common and just putting the dampers in line with the moment frame and sharing columns, beams, et cetera. Uh, but sometimes people will put the dampers just outside of the perimeter frames, for example. And if you put them just outside of, of the dampers, you can share the column, but without, without sharing um, the, the beams. Um, core solutions, I think, can be extremely attractive. Um, you get to keep your open kind of floor plan so that if there's offices on the perimeter of the building, uh, maybe you need to retrofit the interior columns of the structure. Uh, but these kind of interior core systems, I think, could be really attractive. Um, so one of the last things, uh, we'll move on to the fun stuff, which is, you know, let's talk about how to determine the required amount of damping in the structure to protect it. Um, step one would be to identify a controlling performance objective. Um, typically, you can use, you know, moment demand on a beam. You can look at story drift or roof displacement. Um, for the sake of um, this step, we'll, we'll call that load effect QE, um, not, or maybe not load effect, but, but uh, controlling performance objective. Um, and so if we consider a moment frame structure, here's a 13 moment frame structure, the same as the one I showed you previously. Um, if we do a linear dynamic procedure, um, you could technically find your critical moment demand on your beam. Um, you could take that same linear dynamic procedure and, and take like a critical story drift or, or you could also do a nonlinear static procedure, uh, which is similar to the spectral curve that I showed you earlier, and you can determine the target displacement. Step two would then be to determine the corresponding target performance objective or component capacity that you would need to retrofit the structure to. So again, you would look at the linear dynamic procedure, the moment demand, what would be your target moment capacity of that connection or beam? Uh, what drift would you like to limit the structure to? Uh, or last but not least, and maybe the most straightforward would be the, the target displacement or the, the displacement capacity of the structure. Um, and then ultimately in step three, we can determine the required viscous damping to meet that target performance objective. And so this is actually just an equation. I've taken what I showed you previously with the response spectrum and back solved for the required viscous damping based on our target performance objective and our controlling performance objective. Um, and so we can determine the reduction 
um, that's needed by the amount of damping that's added here. And so once you've determined the required viscous damping to meet your target performance objective, generally the question that people have is, you know, what damper properties are required? I'm gonna go really quick here. Um, so this is the part that I said was really theoretical and I'm gonna kind of jump through this, but essentially modal strain energy methods can be used to determine damper properties, uh, but they're pretty difficult to implement sometimes. Um, and unless you've grown really comfortable with how to use damping applications, there's kind of an easier way. Um, so, so this is the equation that's, that's from the linear procedures from ASCE 41, where we look at the maximum strain energy in the frame and the work done by the, each independent damper. And so the maximum strain energy is basically defined by the mode shape. And it's essentially the same as the maximum kinetic energy. And then you'll look at the energy that's dissipated by each of the dampers in that same modal response. Um, and ultimately, you, for linear dampers, you can come up with an equation that's shown um, in equation 15-19. And that can be helpful, but you really have to dive into the details of a modal response. Um, and so another equation that I'd recommend using um, would be to look at stiffness proportional damping. Um, if you look at stiffness proportional damping, the only characteristics that you really need of the building are your, your target damping objective, the stiffness of each floor level, uh, the number of dampers on the floor level, and just the period and the direction of interest. And so this is a really easy way um, to determine damper properties so that you can uh, begin doing your preliminary design for a retrofit. Um, in conclusion, you know, we talked about a historic background on the application to viscous dampers for seismic retrofit. Um, Viscous dampers are a viable retrofit solution for flexible steel and concrete moment frame buildings. Um, not all vulnerable components may be addressed by supplemental viscous damping. Um, and then a, a damping system design overview uh, has been presented. So thank you so much for allowing me to present today and uh, look forward to uh, the panel discussion. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks to Jay and Ian. We are going to now proceed to the questions and answers section. Uh, first, let me share here. OK, and we have a couple of questions already. Um, if Reed or Brett want to raise their hands, you can ask the question. Um, or I can just read it, if, if you are OK with that. Uh, from Reed Zimmerman uh, for Jay, can you explain the phenomenon within the fluid in the wall dampers, which leads to the first cycle effect? Well, I can give it a, sh a shot. Um, it is a polymer, and I think similar to rubber dampers that also have, well, rubber dampers, I mean, lead rubber uh, isolators, there's this similar effect. As the um, material is being strained, the, um, I don't want to say molecules within it or whatnot, um, they start out, I think, in a kinked way and then they start to get aligned. Now that's not a terribly, um, I'd need to be more of a materials expert to explain it any more than that. Uh, but it is, I think, uh, um, a misalignment of all the, mo of the um, polymers uh, and then them getting straightened out. I, that's as, about as best as I can do with that. Okay, thank you. Um, again, a reminder, if, you, if any of you wanna uh, ask the question, you can always raise your hand and I'll allow you to speak. Uh, but the next question is for, uh, from Brett Lizondia to Jay. Can you expand <laughs> on why the dampers fluid properties lead to requiring the dampers to be transported vertically? It is a very slow moving fluid. Um, I've got a, 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 a um, container of this material on a, a container of this material sitting on my desk. If I were to drop a penny on top of it, it would sit on the top of it. Um, you come back the next morning, that penny will have dropped. Uh, sunk to the bottom. Um, so it does move very, very slowly. Um, it will not immediately pour out if you tip it over. However, over a, an extended period of time, it will move. 
Uh, there's one other important item about it is it is very slightly lighter than water. And so you have to make sure you don't allow water to seep into these um, because over time uh, that water will settle to the bottom and displace the material out the top. Jay, maybe it's worth just to add that the, the general configuration of the damper basically is the vein in the tank, the top detail around the vein coming out of the tank is not a pressurized sealed or let's say high pressure no, seal it, detail. It's, open. it's essentially open. There's actually, as Jay just mentioned, there's there's a cover there to ensure a moisture barrier. But were you to lay them on their sides, then eventually the fluid would would ooze out the top. Yeah, I, I just like to term. mention that it, it is not a closed system. And so as you lay it on its side, it will start to to flow very, very slowly. Um, molasses, oh, we sort of compared it to peanut butter at times when we were joking about it. I think a very thick molasses, uh, it will flow. Which it's, it's not a question that's been posed, but maybe the comments worth adding it, it does beg the question, well, how the heck do you make them? <laughs> and you gotta, okay. get the flu you gotta get the fluid in there, don't you? <laughs> yeah. They uh, take this fluid out of drums and uh, heat the fluid up to, uh, I think, 200 degrees, let's say. And uh, as it up to that level, it uh, is less viscous. And then they can pump it in and they pump it into a, uh, an orifice at the bottom of the tank. So it fills from the bottom and then they allow it to cool back down to room temperature. So at room temperature, it flows very, very slowly. Uh, at uh, increased temperatures, it will start to flow more quickly. We did discover this issue about the water. Uh, it exposed one of our tanks to a uh, problem in not having put the rain guard on uh, adequately. And we had some very heavy rain and, and how that rain got funneled into it, it's kind of a mystery, but uh, we came back on a, like a Monday or Tuesday morning and the material had floated out the top and down the sides. Um, very, very sticky material. It's very hard to clean. By the way, this material is used in all sorts of things. I understand it's used to seal the insides of uh, basketballs and footballs. Uh, it's used inside of transformers. The material itself has been around for decades, um, which gave us a lot of confidence. You know, this is not a brand new synthetic material that would just been made up. Up. It's been around for quite some time. This is just a new use for that, that material. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting comment, Jay. It sort of t segues to the 3M viscoelastic material, which originally was a byproduct of their adhesive technologies and got into application and structural damping, but it's been used in many other arenas. Uh, it's used in uh, electronics and precision electronics to damp the movement of uh, hard drive heads. Uh, I heard once it's used in tennis racket shafts and other um, sports type applications. So yeah, akin to the material that Jay's talking about for the viscous wall dampers, the viscoelastic material is also widely used in different industries. Actually extensively used in uh, aerospace and automotive as well, where it's used in it's called constrained layer damping. They'll put a one layer of material on a vibratory panel to calm it down. Okay, we, we have one more question for the dampers, but I'm gonna skip to the next one and then we'll go back to Victor's question to kind of um, discuss another topic. Uh, from Mohamed Salehi, can you please talk about the pros and cons of self-centering dampers? such as shape memory alloy based dampers. Are they as attractive to practitioners as they are in the academia? And I'm assuming Ian. <laughs> yeah, the shape memory, memory alloys have um, been a topic of great interest for several decades. Um, actually, they first evolved um, in the 1960s in Defense Department research. But we in the 80s and 90s at Berkeley investigated and elsewhere, there was a big European project that looked at shape memory alloys into the 90s and early 2000s. There are actually a number of projects 
uh, a small number of projects where they've been utilized for some retrofits. Um, they have inherently interesting characteristics, but are rather difficult to harness for seismic structural. Um, one of the, uh, the, the material properties are achieved by a lot of processing, um, which means often uh, drawing material down to rather small diameter wire to achieve the um, enhanced material properties that are attractive. It's not so easy to get the same properties in large diameter or large, large chunks of material. Um, so they've really only seen limited application. Price points are a challenge. Um, the shape memory alloys that have been the subject of a lot of research um, historically have been nickel titanium alloys. There are, there's a, a lot of work actually that went into in Chile in well, a decade or so ago looking at um, copper based alloys, copper aluminum based alloys. But I guess the, the, the conclusion or the summary is that they have not seen a lot of application. Um, in general, the interest about around self-centering behavior is pretty high because the the desire or the, the inherent interest to have a structure that's going to bring it back, bring itself back to where it started, even under nonlinear dissipated behavior, is attractive for limiting drift and minimizing post-earthquake, well, minimizing damage and, and imp enhancing recovery characteristics for structures, making them more resilient to use the word of the day or the decade. Anything to add, anyone else? Let's go back to Victor's question. Victor Garcia Delgado asks, to what extent are first cycle effects influenced by the differences between static and dynamic coefficients of friction? I don't think of the behavior as, as really having anything to do with friction. Um, it's a viscous material, a very thick liquid um, through which a vein is traveling. Um, the coefficient, the, 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 if it were, if it had something to do with the uh, coefficient of friction, the dynamic versus the static, I think you would see that first cycle effect no matter what the uh, uh, displacement was or no matter what the um, velocity was. And in this case, it's really that first cycle effect only shows up at high displacements and high velocities. I, I don't think friction is the mechanism that's going on there. Okay, from Rebecca Collins, for friction dampers, are there issues with airborne particles during displacement? For example, older friction devices used asbestos. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm not aware that uh, they did use asbestos even in the late 80s. The pole type devices, I believe, were utilizing non-asbestos brake pad material. Yes, in discussing the friction dampers, I didn't say anything about what the interfaces are. Um, typically, they're a metallic, non-metallic interface utilizing different forms, essentially, of um, brake pad type materials or materials that are used in, in industry to control and reduce motion. Um, they have very high uh, wear, very good wear, characteristics, non-degrading characteristics. Actually, I'm would, to your own question about asbestos, I'm not familiar. Uh, from Chaming Wang, uh, can Ian comment on the use of passive damping in New Zealand? Yeah, devices like the um, Tectonis um, recentering friction device and other types of devices have seen use. There was you know, following um, the Christchurch series in 2011, now 10 years ago, there was a distinct upswing initially in the use of seismic isolation. The enthusiasm jaded or faded over time when um, stakeholders looked more carefully at cost and decided they were less willing to 
throw the extra against isolation, but there has been a significant increase in interest in uh, the term that's often used in New Zealand is low damage design, um, low damage solutions and um, associated with sustainable practice. So the recentering systems um, often um, combined with sustainable materials are seeing quite a number of project applications. And Victor has a follow-up. I think he meant the devices with plates for the friction question, but I think there's no friction within, with plates on the dampers that Jay talked about. Um, so let's, let's go to the next one from Doug Nyman or Neiman. Please comment on the suitability of viscous dampers in Arctic environments. Uh, for example, temperatures well below freezing or is it necessary to provide a controlled temperature environment? Certainly the polyisobutylene would not be an appropriate material um, outside of the controlled environment. Uh, I assume there are other materials that could provide the equivalent of viscosity, um, but given the temperature, it would not be polyisobutylene. I have a question for Ian, actually, on the sheer coupling beam-like uh, elements you showed at the end of your presentation, right? The, the dampers that, that joined uh, two walls. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I noticed that this is a vertical movement. And where, where is the slab then, uh, the, the floor slab uh, with respect to the, the dampers? Is it above or below or? Is it yeah, typically, so the floor slab is separated and would be some, well, maybe 200 millimeters above the damper itself. So the damper, at least in the, in the application, one of the building applications where they were using coupling beams in the building in Toronto, they essentially fill the pocket above the architectural headspace in the, in the architectural pl plenum that a concrete coupling beam would have otherwise filled, but the damper itself is physically separate and dropped below the presence of the floor slab. Makes sense. I have a question for Aaron. Um, you were commenting, or you are talking about the use of nonlinear dampers and I've noticed they have been, seem to be used a lot more. For example, the, the alpha coefficient of 0.3. And when you do that, you go from essentially from an elliptical shape to a more of a rectangular shape, which would kind of seem more like a friction damper now. And uh, you commented on, well, you get more energy dissipation um, in that sense. And yeah, I have seen studies where these have been, I guess, a lot more effective. Um, but then the other issue is when you look at the large, dis at the uh, peak displacements, um, then you comment on this when we we're talking about the column axle forces that the fact that the damper forces when they're linear out of out of phase with uh, the the force uh, the, the the forces in the frame, and so is that an issue with using nonlinear dampers like say an alpha of three, and getting larger forces than the dampers when the frames are also at the maximum? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think that a lot of structural engineering firms will, you know, look at a specific project and, you know, they'll kind of take different alphas within the range of 0.3 to 0.5. And it's, you know, that constant, you know, response that it depends, depending on your structure and, and, and what you're looking on. Um, but, but essentially for me, when I look at it, um, the, it kind of has to do with what we're comfortable with. And I think every structural engineer has kind of been raised to really like capacity-based design. You know, I talk about raised, but we, we like knowing that beyond our design velocity or whatever our maximum velocity, that if that velocity was increased 50% more, well, the force would increase 50% uh, more. And so a linear damper is gonna have a proportional increase in force. And then you have to design your connections and your columns for those forces. But people really like the nonlinear damper, not just probably because manufacturers like it too, um, but also because um, they know that beyond their design event, the force will not increase more. If you look at the effects of a 0.3 versus a 0.5 or, or definitely a 1.0, you know, you are going to have a more out of phase behavior. Um, sometimes you don't necessarily need it though. The columns may still be strong enough. And really what you're just looking for is the reduction in drift in the columns can handle the axial load from the dampers and, and the, um, 
and the uh, and the moments in, in the columns, for example, or the beams from those forces. Yeah, Sorry. Gilbert, Gilberto, I'd say that uh, probably in the in the biggest scheme of things, linear dampers have been relatively less commonly used. Certainly in building superstructure retrofits, I'd say the vast majority of the applications, and Aaron, you should correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the vast majority are probably around that 0.3 or 0.4. It, earlier on, there was some use of a 0.7 exponent, but I think it's really dropped down around mm -hmm. 0.3 to 0.5 because yeah. of exactly the, the benefit that Aaron describes as controlling the uncertainty in the extreme load condition. Yeah, it's just, just a, a curious, uh, from more of an academic, when you look at the loops, right, you're approaching essentially a, a steel hysteretic damper or a friction damper. It's getting more rectangular. I'm uh, going from, from that oval shape to, to rectangular. So that's kind of why I was thinking about that. In, so just one mm -hmm. thing I'll say in comparison to that, because I, I have heard that before, you know, and you if you mm -hmm. look at the hysteretic loops, they look like that. But the effect on frequency is different, right? Because those devices add stiffness to the structure. And so you're altering the period, whereas dampers aren't going to alter the period of the structure. So there's another benefit that's happening from using a velocity de dependent device over a displacement dependent device that even if you look at an energy dissipation loop and they look similar, you're not seeing that one still being more efficient. Yeah, the other aspect is the low amplitude behavior that the rate dependent devices are going to be there for all ranges of movement. And, you know, hysteretic, well, the friction doesn't move until you exceed the threshold mm -hmm. and the yielding steel is going to have some elastic component that's not, it's doing stiffness, but it's not doing anything for you with damping. Mm -hmm. So that's the other a distinguishing feature as well. Yeah, thank you. Is another question in general for, for all the, the panelists too, because this was something that we talked about last week or a question that was asked. In terms of cost, um, is it more expensive to design a new building or retrofit with uh, dampers? And if so, is there like a, and I think we talked about isolation last time. Some of the panelists said we had about a two, 3% increase in construction costs. Do you know where the uh, dampers lie in that scheme? Uh, scheme? On a structural, on a steel moment frame, uh, with tight uh, drift limits, we're spending most of our money providing stiffness in the steel. You're buying an awful lot of steel for deformation control or displacement control. Mm -hmm. um, we did a, a comparison study between our damped moment frame and what the moment frame would have to be without the dampers. And uh, we saved roughly about a 33% of the steel cost. Uh, mm -hmm. When you add back the cost of the dampers, I'd say we had an overall savings of 25%. So on a steel moment frame with tight um, drift requirements, you never get to use that R of A. You're, you're using something quite a bit smaller. Um, so you're able to reduce the amount of steel substantially. Now, given that you can no, never go below a base shear of 0.75 times that, that that's the lower bound uh, for reduction in forces for strength. But at least now you're using the steel for its strength and not for its stiffness. Yeah, and remember, you, you even, well, um, I mean, the double whammy is you put the extra steel into control drift, but you're, st you're still ending up with higher accelerations that affect contents as well, because the dampers are doing double duty for you there. And I think from a retrofit standpoint, Gilberto, it, the proof's kind of in the pudding. You know, it's, it's most pre-Northridge moment frames, I would say, these days are being retrofitted with viscous dampers. And so that's something that you, know, you probably talk to a steel contractor or a retrofit contractor, and he's going to be able to tell you why that's the solution that when they compare different bids, that's the one that they go with. The devices themselves may be more expensive, but it's the global retrofit that, that typically is, is um, what people are looking for. And then at the end of the day, that, and that does, that's you know, not considering life cycle effects performance-based design and what would happen after the earthquake. I'm going to have to go with this question that comes from Turkey. And I thank everyone for the extra minutes. This is from Ufuk from Istanbul. Thank you for this highly informative seminar. I wonder what do, what do the speakers think about future trends in the prices of the dampers? 
Do they predict any significant change in the cost of these devices in the near future as a result of advances in manufacturer technologies, additive manufacturing, for example, et cetera? I am I certainly don't know about the trends in the cost of the devices. However, the cost of structural steel uh, is the primary cost in the structure. Um, and as that price goes up, um, I think it would go up in, I don't, I'm guessing here that it go up independent of the dampers. And so you could, uh, savings in steel by using the dampers, I think is, makes it a much more attractive uh, system, uh, looking at the total, totality of the cost as opposed to the cost of the dampers by themselves. And now I'm referring to steel, new steel buildings. Yeah, with regard to the question uh, about uh, manufacturing technologies and the like, I'd say it largely turns around economies of scale. And at this point, we're still looking at these devices as largely labor intensive, really handmade, handcrafted devices. Uh, the analogous field, of course, of seismic isolation, where you're also looking at you know, devices that are there for special seismic enhancement. And, but for a few exceptions, I would say that even with the larger scale in the isolation industry, most of the devices are really custom manufactured or, or labor intensive manufacturing. I know of one bearing manufacturer in Japan that has um, started to venture into semi-automated robotic manufacturing, but they need to, you need to get to tens of thousands of units per year to be able to justify the development and the capital cost to put that sort of equipment in place. And it's maybe a cause and effect, but we've got to see the market grow, I think, before we'd be, see any big changes in what the manufacturers are doing. Yeah, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that it's, it's changed a lot in the last 20 years. I mean, if you look at some of the costs back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and relative, you know, considering inflation, um, the product, you know, has become a, a less expensive device. And, and I think as people use these products more and more, just like Ian said, um, they will relatively become less expensive. Yeah, and with the latest spike in steel costs, also probably we all should be talking to our contractors and architects to see if dampers are an option. And with that, I wanna thank uh, the speakers, um, co-moderators and everyone that attended. Um, please join us next Friday for the third and final part for, of the Ishihara Colloquium on soil structure interaction. Thank you very much for attending.